Martin Luther, Zwingli, Tyndale, and many others recognize the error in the doctrine and the teaching of the papacy. So they protested the abuses of the papal church, the church of Rome, which, by the way, papal Rome replaced pagan Rome. We're going to look at this. Let me say it again. Papal Rome replaced pagan Rome, but it's still Rome is still the same beast. The power was just transferred from papal or pagan Rome to pagan Rome, wherein the Caesars and Caesar's Senate once ruled pagan Rome, the Pope, his cardinals, bishops, archbishops, seized that same power and ruled papal Rome. Hence, the Holy Wars. You remember the Holy Wars? The, you remember the Crusades, the Inquisitions, all of that? Okay, that's papal Rome. That is a false apostate church trying to force its belief, convictions, and creeds upon the masses to, to control them in the name of God and the, the, the result of not accepting the authority was death. That's how the dragon speaks. America, apostate Protestantism will replicate those abuses, thus making an image to the beast. Y'all stay with me. Y'all stay with me. I know some people are saying, oh, this is too far-fetched. You know, this is this is some stuff, you know, I guess he got a download or I guess he got... No, no, no. All of the Protestant reformers, all of them, taught what I'm teaching now. This is is what the reformers understood that is what caused them to go under great persecution from papal Rome. That's why they were branded as heretics. That's why people left the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they fleed from the papacy because it was exposed as being the antichrist system of the book of Revelation via the prophecies of Daniel. Folks, just read some, just read, just, just read some of the reformers. That's all you have to do. I'm not talking about John MacArthur and some of these Johnny come latelys who, you know, who perpetrate the same nonsense. I'm talking about going back, reading Luther, Zwingli, read their understanding of biblical prophecy. And you'll see what was fueling the Reformation. We've forgotten because we have become apostate and we are more like the, 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 the daughters of the harlot, Revelation 17, than we are the bride of Christ, Revelation 12. Okay, let's, let's keep going. I didn't plan to go there, but let me keep going. Protestantism will end this act, join hands with popery, it will be nothing less than giving life to the beast whose deadly wound was healed. We're going to look at this deadly wound in a minute. Giving life back to the tyranny that has long been eagerly watching for an opportunity to spring again into activity. So you said, well, Gerald, what are you saying? I'm saying that the same tyranny that was perpetrated by the papacy beginning in right around uh, 400, 476, 538 AD and continued down to the 1700s when the, the wound was inflicted, the deadly wound of Rome, 
See, now, when we talk about this stuff now, when you talk about the abuses and the tyranny and the apostasy of, 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 pap of, of papal Rome, people look at you like you're strange because that's not the picture. That's not the image of the papacy that most of us have. See, see nowadays, because that deadly wound is being healed, people look at the Pope and think he's God on earth and he's not. The Pope visits nations shut down because the Pope is visiting. The whole world wandered after the beast. Let me keep going. So it says, <laughs> Revelation 13, I saw one of his heads as if it were mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled after the beast. History will repeat itself again. False religion, now, now listen, false religion will again be exalted. That's not, that shouldn't be a far-fetched understanding for anybody nowadays to understand. False religion is, is that, that's the call of the day. Don't, don't give me Bible. Don't, don't give, <laughs> don't give me chapter and verse. Don't give me line upon line. Don't give me solid teaching. Don't give me solid doctrine. Give me a revelation. Give me a download. Give me, give me a prophet who can prophesy smooth things to me. But don't give me scripture. Don't give me what Jesus said. Don't give me what Paul said. Don't give me what Peter said. Don't give me Bible. Because that's just your opinion. Because everybody can interpret the Bible for themselves. Yeah, they can. Under the inspiration and the enlightenment and the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's one of the foundational principles of the Reformation. That, that we are free to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. But that doesn't mean we just make the Bible say what we want it to say. That means that we submit ourselves to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And we go line upon line, precept upon precept. The Bible isn't a book of mystery. There's mysteries in it. <laughs> <laughs> but the Bible isn't a book. There's some kind of mysterious book locked up in, 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 in the back room of a church. No, that's what that's what the papacy did. Chained the Bible up and then told the people, we're the only ones that can interpret it. So what we say it says, that's what it says. And if you don't accept what we say, you're a heretic. We'll burn you at the stake. We'll hunt you down. Wake up, people. Babylon is falling. It's falling. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sin. This is all part of the 2024 global reset. So history will repeat itself. False religion will be exalted. <laughs> all nations, tongue, and people will be commanded to worship this false system of religious worship. Now, as America, the, the land, quote unquote, of religious liberty unites with the papacy. Now, you need to understand this. Enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor false religious worship. The people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Listen, folk. America hails itself as a Christian nation, right? So if, if you look worldwide and you think about Christianity, people say, well, if you want to, if you want to see a Christian nation, just look to America because America is a Christian nation founded upon the Judeo Christian ethic. No, it wasn't. America was founded upon lies, manipulation, seduction, murder, hatred, slavery. Need I go on? <laughs> now, the people who came to America, 
some of them, were actually coming because they wanted to live in a country that wasn't ruled by a king, and they wanted to belong to a church that wasn't ruled by a pope. Read your American history books. <laughs> this is all I'm saying, folks. What I'm talking about is history. But what I'm attempting to show is all of this history is already given to us and foretold to us through biblical prophecy. I've already said I'm not anti-American. I love being an American, but I worship God. Let me say it again. I love being an American, but I worship God. I pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God. And so whenever American laws and government and legislations go contrary to scripture, I follow scripture. America was designed to be a nation in which you can do that. It's called freedom of conscience. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, that includes African-Americans, by the way, because see, when they wrote that, we weren't included. But I'm just saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men were created equal in the sight of God and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that being the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are God-given liberties. Whenever a nation or a church seek to subvert that principle, you've got a problem. Whenever the church uses the state to enforce its belief, you've got a problem. That's what happened with the papacy. Let me keep going. The question of worship will be the issue in the great final conflict in which all of the world will act a part. Okay. So let me go here. The so-called Christian world is to be the theater of the great and decisive actions of the end times. The what? The, 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 the Christian world? Meaning, authority, many in authority, in the Christian world, will enact laws designed to control the conscience after the example of the papacy. Let me say this again. Well, let me say this. This should be a far-fetched idea for many people to understand if you simply look at what's happening in our political system today and who's controlling the arguments in the political system today. It's the Christian right. They call it Christian nationalism. And they are seeking tonight to enact laws that govern people's conscience. That's just, that's, that's just the beginning of the agenda, folks. That's the beginning of the agenda. Okay. So they will enact laws designed to control the conscience after the example of the papacy. Babylon, this false system, will make all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's all of the false doctrine, all of the false systems of worship, all of the false understandings of church and state that was implemented in the papacy is going to reemerge again. Folk, it's happening as we speak. Check the roles of your Congress. America is supposed to be a Protestant nation. That's what they say, right? 
It's supposed to be a Protestant nation. Correct? All right. Five, seven, I think we have seven chief justices or eight. The majority, the majority rule on our Supreme Court is Catholic. The majority of legislatures in the Senate, in the Congress, is Catholic, but it's a Protestant nation. If you know anything about Catholicism, their utmost loyalty is to the papacy and the Church of Rome, not political structures. They use political structures to carry out the agenda of the papacy. Oh, folks, listen. <laughs> there will be a universal bond of union, one great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces. Why? Because he's going to give their power and strength. This confederacy is going to give their power and their strength unto this beast. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty that's the freedom to worship god according to the dictates of your conscience as was manifested by the papacy when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of romanism to make the long story short the state will implement what it deems to be acceptable worship. I'm talking about within Christianity. I mean, we already know if, if, if you're Muslim, if you're a Hindu, if you're anything other than a Christian, other in America, you're already looked at as suspect. <laughs> okay, we already know this. Y'all know that. Y'all know that. Okay. Well, it's going to go further than that. And is going to begin to go into what they are deciding is acceptable forms of worship, even within Christianity. You say, well, that can't happen. Yes, it can. That's why now I have to say this, like I said in class, I'm not saying I'm pro LGBTQ. I'm not saying I'm pro life. I'm not saying any of that. All right. I'm using those as an example of what I'm saying. You can be a believer and own a business, right? And your conscience can say, you're not going to sell goods to certain individuals, right? Okay. They'll take it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will force you. Say, but it's violating my conscience. It doesn't matter. This is the ruling of the Supreme Court. Same thing with an abortion. That's the, it's the same issue with abortion. You can't legislate morality. You can't legislate people's conscience. Now, again, I'm not saying I'm pro either of them. I'm simply showing how many of these issues are funneling their way into the courts of justice and they're becoming laws that everyone must abide by. Okay. So here's some cru crucial questions because this is what we know. The deadly wound was healed. I want to look at that before we close. Which weapon did the beast use to slay the saints? What weapon gave the beast its mortal wound? What does the sword symbolize? How and when did the beast acquire the sword that it used to kill? And what is meant by the deadly wound? All right, so let's examine a few of these. And I've got to go pretty quick with this. Because Revelation 13 says this in the in the, in the midst of talking about the bees there seems there seems to be this verse that's dropped in there that it doesn't seem like it it, it even fits and it's this 
<laughs> Verse 10, Revelation 13. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So in the midst of talking about these beasts, all of a sudden, this thing jumps up. He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So let's look at this. When the scripture talks about a sword... Let's, let's consider something. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, he begins, the Apostle Paul begins to talk about the believer's armor, right? Verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, now watch, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, have, having the breastplate of righteousness, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The only offensive weapon the church has is the sword, the sword of the spirit. All of the rest of the armor is defensive. So we know in one sense, the sword is representative of the word of God. But there is another sword that is also mentioned in scripture. So let's look at that one. Let's look at Romans chapter 13. And it's interesting that he's writing this to believers in Rome. But watch this. Romans chapter 13. And let's read verse. Let's read verses 1 through 4. And Paul is writing instructing believers how to live out their life in the context of everyday culture and everyday society. This is what he says. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will you then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you shall have praise of the same. Now, this is talking about the legitimate use of civil governmental power, the rulers that be. There's a reason we have a speed limit, and it's a law. If you break the speed limit and you get a ticket, you're getting a ticket justifiably there are laws that are implemented that help govern civil society that is god ordained so i'm not an anarchist <laughs> okay there are laws that are given to govern society and the laws are in place not to check good, but to check evil. So the only time you have to fear that law is if you're breaking the law. Are you with me? All right, let's keep reading. Verse 4. He, talking about the person that yields that power, is the minister, servant of God to you for good. 
if you do that which is evil, be afraid. Why? Because he bears not the sword in vain. He is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. What is civil law and civil government referred to as a sword? Now, mind you, this is being written to Roman believers in like the first century. So we know that Rome executed, you know, the Roman garrisons and Roman laws and, and all of that good stuff. They carried them out by their laws and they used weapons known as swords. Do you remember when the Roman legions came to arrest Jesus in the garden? The scripture says Peter pulled out what? a sword and cut off the servant's ear. Jesus reached down, picked up the man's ear, healed it, put it back together, told Peter to put up the sword. That's not the way we do business. That's not the way that the kingdom operates. The kingdom doesn't operate by that kind of a sword. The kingdom operates by the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But there are two swords. There is the sword of civil power and there's the sword of the power of the spirit or the kingdom of God. Why? Because there are two kingdoms in conflict. So when Jesus goes before Caesar, who is representing Rome, papal, Caesar asked the question. He said, are you king of the Jews? Jesus says, are you asking me this of your own volition or did somebody tell you about it? Jesus said, don't you know, Pilate says, or, 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 or Pilate, yeah, Pilate says, don't you know that I have the power to set you free? Jesus said, don't you understand that if I wanted to, I could call, I could, I could, I could pray to the father. And he said, 10,000 legions of angels to set me free. Their kingdoms in conflict. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of the enemy. Caesar represents the kingdom of the enemy. Jesus represents the kingdom of God. Two kingdoms who use two different swords to execute the laws of those kingdoms. That's civil and spiritual power. One sword represents civil power. The other sword represents the sword of the spirit or spiritual power, which is the word of God. Are you with me? All right, let's keep going. So what sword did the papacy use to persecute the people of God? Which one? The sword that is mentioned in Romans 13 threatens civil penalties, incarceration, confiscation of goods, fines, death. Remember, in Romans 13, those that don't receive the image of the beast, they can't buy nothing, they can't sell, they can't trade, their commerce is cut off. Okay. The passage makes it clear that in the time of the Apostle Paul, the particular sword civil power did not belong to the church. It belonged to the Roman state. That sword is punitive. It's for punishment. It's not persuasive as the word of God. That's the sword that papal Rome used to persecute the people of God during the 1260 years of persecution. Remember, the papacy, the Church of Rome, is a state and it is a church. That's why they have Vatican City. It's a church, but it's also a state. That's what they got their own police force. They got their own military. They, get, they have everything every other nation has. So the Pope yields both civil and religious power. And it's all confined in the papacy. Y'all stay with me. Now, it is true 
God established both. He established civil power and he established spiritual power. He established the church. He established the state. What are the two governing authorities or kingdoms present in the United States? We have what's called the separation of church and state. Why? Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion. Why not? Because we know what that leads to. The founding fathers understood what happens when you mix church and state. They experienced it from the Church of England and they experienced it from the Church of Rome. They don't want a king calling the shots for a church and they don't want a pope or a religious figure calling shots for the state. That's the papacy. So when they set up this nation, it was specifically set up to keep those powers separate. What we are witnessing today is the union of the two. That's why there's, there's big arguments today uh, coming out of a lot of Christian right circles that the idea of the separation of church and state is a fallacy. They're saying there is no, that's not what the founding fathers uh, uh, meant when they said the separation of church and state. They didn't mean that the church shouldn't influence the state. They meant that the state shouldn't influence the church. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we put all of these religious figures into governmental powers to carry out their whims of what they believe the church should do. And then they make it law and then they use civil law to punish spiritual non-submissive individuals. Question, was Jesus crucified under civil or religious power? That's just a question. He was, not per, he was not crucified under religious power. He was crucified under civil power. But he was turned over to civil power by who? By the Pharisees religious power because they knew they did not have the power to carry out corporal punishment. So they got in bed with Rome, sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver money, turned him over to civil power and then pushed civil power into the corner. He said, well, how did they do that? Because they said, when Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Take him and, and deal with him according to your law. What did they say? Shall I crucify? They, Pilate asked him, should I crucify your king? What did they say? We have no king but Caesar. And if you let this man go because he claims to be a king, you're, not, you're no friend of Caesar. So they manipulated civil power into carrying out their unjust desires. And apostate Christianity has been doing the exact same thing since that time. That will reemerge in the day in which we live. We will see an apostate church back civil power into a corner and cause them to carry out the same atrocities that pagan and papal Rome carried out with the people of God because it's all part of that beast system. That's why it's called Babylon. The whole thing is called Babylon. I think I'll stop there. No, let me give you one other, one other, one other passage and then I'll be done. How did the papacy, because it says here that the dragon gave his power to this beast. So we understand 
pagan Rome under whom Jesus was crucified. That's pagan Rome. How did pagan Rome become papal Rome? You remember that little horn that rose up in the book of Daniel? That's the Antichrist power. That little horn that rose up and began to speak blasphemy against God, blasphemy his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. That's why they have a completely different priesthood than Jesus set up. Scripture tells us the apostolic witness is that Jesus is our high priest and we take our sin to Jesus and that's who we confess our sin to and he forgives us, not within the papacy, not within Romanism. You take your, you take your sin to a priest and then you say a certain amount of hair marries and then the priest will pronounce forgiveness. And then Mary will take your sin to Jesus and ask Jesus to forgive you. They got a whole different priesthood set up. The scriptures teach because of the reformation, the priesthood of the believer, meaning every believer is a priest. Jesus is our great high priest, but every believer is a priest. It's called the priesthood of the believer. That's a fundamental Protestant tenet. <laughs> Whether you're Calvinist, Lutheran, Armenian, doesn't matter. The priesthood of the believer. Romanism does not believe in the priesthood of the believer. It believes in the priesthood. And that's a select group of people. That's the only priest there are. So all of the, the work that the high priest, Jesus, is doing in the tabernacle is null and void within Roman Catholicism. It's null and void. Why? Because this power is going to open his mouth and blasphemy against God. He's going to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. That's why they're trying to put saints in heaven. That's why they try to say who's a saint and who's not. The scripture teaches all believers are saints. Paul said to you, call to be saints. But according to Romanism, you have to be declared to be a saint. And then when you get baptized or sprinkled, I should say, into the church, they assign you a patron saint. That's why you got St. Christopher and St. This person, St. The Other Person and St. The Other Person. If I, I forget who, I, I forget how many they got. All their idol worship. Why? Because they've changed the law of God. Scripture says don't make any graven images. They worship images. Because Papal Rome is nothing more than a continuation of pagan Rome in Christian garb. Okay. Between the year 300 AD and the years 476, this is when we had all of them barbarian tribes that came down from the north, invaded and carved up the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire did not fall because another nation came in and sacked them. The Roman Empire fell because of its own internal issues, kind of like what's going on in America. That's what caused Rome to fall. Their, their, their politicians have become so corrupt. Their priests from all of their gods were corrupt. They, they, they treated their citizens like merchandise, you know, kind of like America. Same thing. <laughs> but the last emperor, Romulus Augustulus, was deposed in 476 AD. He was deposed without an emperor the empire was thrown into turmoil. However, they did have a bishop in Rome. Now, this was before the Pope became head of the whole church. He was just the bishop of Rome. But he stepped in to that vacuum of powerlessness in the leadership, and he assumed a new role. So now he's not only the spiritual leader of the church, he was also the temporal leader 
of the state of Rome. So he was at one time simply the Bishop of Rome over the church. When Rome fell and the, the barbarian nations came and started dividing it up because of the vacuum of power, he was enticed to assume temporal leadership of the state. So now the Pope became the leader of the state of Rome and the church of Rome. So in essence, listen to, Car to Cardinal Manning. This is the Cardinal in the Catholic church. This is what he says. He describes the manner in which the Roman pontiff gained civil power in the Roman Empire. When the barbarians invaded the Roman Empire, it tore apart. Now watch. The abandonment of Rome, and I quote, this is from Edward Manning's book, The Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ. Okay? This is a quote. The abandonment was the liberation of the pontiff. Whatsoever claim to obedience, the emperors, now watch, may have made and whatsoever compliance the pontiff may have yielded, the whole previous relation was annulled again and again by the vices and outrages of the emperors. It was finally dissolved by a higher power. So there's already a power struggle in Rome between the Bishop of Rome and the Caesars. You remember reading about Christians being thrown to the lion's den and all of the atrocities that took place under pagan Rome, that didn't stop until what we're talking about now. Well, in 328, we had, uh, what, what, was, what was his name? Constantine, who made Christianity the official state religion. That's what ended the persecutions in Rome against Christians. Christianity became the state religion. So now, basically, you know, to be Roman was to be Christian. To be Christian was to be Roman. So all you had to be was born, just be born in Rome. <laughs> Sounds like America. People say, well, I'm a Christian. What makes you a Christian? Well, I'm an American. I was born in America. America is a Christian nation. It's, the, the similarities are phenomenal. But at any rate, uh, the providence of God permitted, this is Cardinal Manning, the providence of God permitted a succession of interruptions. Gothics, the Lombards, Hungarian, to desolate Italy and to efface it from every remnant of the empire. So the pontiffs found themselves alone the sole fountains of order, peace, law, and safety. So from this hour, this liberation, the chains fell off from the hands of the successor of St. Peter. And I don't have time to get into why Peter was not the first pope. Do you know there's no historical record that Peter ever went to Rome? So how do we say that Peter was first pope? That's a misapplication of Matthew chapter 16. We know Paul went to Rome. <laughs> There's no record Peter ever went to Rome. Peter was an apostle in Jerusalem, not in Rome. Okay, let me keep going. So it says, chains fell off. So the papacy, well, there's one particular one that I'm looking for. Okay, here it is. It, the papacy waited until such a time, and this is what they believe, that God would break his bonds asunder and should liberate it from subjugation and civil power and enthrone it in the possession of a temporal sovereignty of its own. What Manning is saying is that when the civil power of Rome was removed by the barbarians, the bishop of Rome filled the vacuum and became the arbiter in civil affairs as well as in religious. So Manning describes this assumption of civil power by the Bishop of Rome with expressions such as breaking bonds asunder and chains falling off. That terminology, I might add, is reminiscent 
of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when it talks about the mystery of iniquity and he that withholds. See, all of this plays into it. So the popes are actually the successors of the Caesars. And the papacy took the seat of authority from Rome, not from Jesus. So they got their power to rule. That is a transfer of authority from pagan Rome to papal Rome. That's why there's so much similarity between the papacy and pagan Rome. It's, it's, you look at it, it's hard to tell the difference. So the Pope is not Jesus's successor. He's Caesar's successor. And he yields the power of both church and state. And it is emerging today. Look at any time in the past 50 years where the Pope has gone anywhere. Look at how he's received. The man is literally worshiped as God on earth. The man of sin, the son of perdition, who has set up his throne in the midst of the temple of God, the church, not an earthly temple in Jerusalem. That's false eschatology that two Catholic theologians develop. Futurism and preterism <laughs> that pushes everything in the future because it's been exposed who the what the papacy actually is it's, that's the antichrist system who's had a deadly wound and unfortunately i didn't get to the deadly wound but the thing that we know is the wound that killed or that that was used the instrument that was used to inflict the deadly wound was not the sword of the spirit it was civil power and when we look back at what happened during the French Revolution, when Napoleon sent General, uh, I believe his name was Bercier, sent one of his generals into Rome and dethroned the Pope and took his power in the 1700s, that is the deadly wound. That is what broke Rome's power over the world. Up until that time, Rome still controlled the world, but they did it through the church. That's why we had the Holy Wars, the Inquisitions, the Crusades, the Conquest, all of that. This is history, people. This is history. I hope you got something out of this. I know it was a lot, and I'll do a, a continuation of this teaching um, within a couple of days. Because this, th this is information that we really need to know. I know it's different. I know it may be the first time you've ever kind of heard Revelation 13 talked about in this way. Because generally when we talk about it, it's very uh, spectacular. It's uh, <laughs> very sensational. And it's, it's, it's really ahistorical. Ahistorical as in it has no historical relevance at all. But this is actually what it is. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to him to show unto his church things that must come to pass. This is revealing Jesus' work with his church, the book of Revelation, until the final day of his coming. So now that we've defined who the beast is, and we've kind of touched on what the image to the beast is going to be. That's apostate Christianity seizing civil power and beginning to operate exactly the way Rome did when, when, when the church of Rome seized civil power. That's the image. Next, we're going to define what the mark is. And you'll be amazed because the mark is in your forehead and it's in your hand. But I will tell you this, it has to do with worship. Amen. Amen. This has been fun. This has been real. If you'd like to know more information about the ministry, 
Here's the information of where you can contact us. If you'd like to join us in the class on 2024, the Global Reset, where we're going into this even more in depth, visit the website of freedomcreation.net. Look under courses. Go ahead and sign up for uh, the class 2024 uh, Global Reset. If you've missed any of the sections, they were all recorded. They're available in the classroom. You can get caught up and then join us live on Sunday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will be doing a part two of, of this class. It'll be about a five or six week class because there's just too much in here for me to cover in four or five weeks. This is stuff I've been looking at, oh my goodness, over 30, 35 years. I've researched, I've prayed, I've, I've studied, I've learned, I've unlearned, I've had adjustments, I've had corrections. But this isn't something that I got because I ate pizza late at night and I got a divine revelation. This has come through study, prayer, conversation with other men and women of God, a lot of reading in the church history, reading uh, what, what, the, what the reformers believed and what caused the reformation and information about the development of the papacy and all of the various councils, good stuff. I'm a church history nerd, so y'all forgive me. But I love you. Have a great week. If you have any questions, my email is on the screen. I look to hear from you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Go back and listen to this three, four times. Send me an email for the notes. Talk with you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>